Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I am going to be showing you around my kids' playroom. I'm really excited to do this. I did like a clean with me video and you got to see like a little glimpse into our playroom and I did have a few questions about our playroom so I thought I would share it with you. I'm more than happy to do so. I'm very passionate about our playroom and I really love it. It's got a few more little things that we still need to change about it as we just moved here. Here at home, we do follow the Montessori method so our playroom is definitely Montessori inspired by no means is our playroom 100% Montessori. We still incorporate some other things that I just know the kids love, um, and I'll kind of show you those and point those out as we go along. But we definitely, it's definitely inspired by Montessori, and we do practice that here at home. So I have two kids. I have a little boy and a little girl. My son Zayden is three years old, and my daughter Evira is two years old. So this playroom is definitely set up for both of them to be able to uh, do activities. Some things are a little bit too challenging for my daughter, as I'll show you along the way and then other things my son has already kind of mastered. However, they're still here out on the playroom shelves um, for my daughter to play with and it's always great for a child to revisit things even though they've already mastered them. But I will take you along and I'll kind of point out what we have out on the shelves right now. I do rotate toys. Um, I don't have a set schedule to when I rotate stuff. I do try to rotate things at least weekly. Um, I sit back a lot of the time and just observe what the kids are playing with and if I notice that they're not gravitating towards something anymore, I might change that activity up slightly or I'll completely take it away and rotate it out with something else. And also just depending on where their focus points are and their sensitive periods as into what they're like zoning in on right now. Uh, for example, my son has been really interested in learning the alphabet and the phonetic sounds. So we've kind of been rolling with that and my daughter's really into counting. So you'll see a lot of materials out on the shelf that kind of cater to those interests that they're in right now. This video is just going to be based on our playroom um, and I'm going to try to keep it not too long because Monastory is so involved and there is a whole lot that goes into it and maybe you're watching this video because you want to incorporate that into your home, into your lifestyle and kind of change things up. So please let me know down below in the comment section if you would like some more in-depth information on Monastory. I can kind of take it back to the basics on where to start and how to incorporate it into your home as well as the practical life aspect of Montessori, just not just not the stuff here in our playroom as well as my kids' rooms and all that kind of stuff. But to, for today's video and the purpose of not getting too carried away, we're just gonna be focusing right here in my children's playroom. Really quickly before we get started, if you are new here, I would love to have you back again. Uh, so don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below and ring the bell so you are notified when I upload videos. I'm really excited to show you guys this Montessori playroom and I would love to incorporate more Montessori inspired videos on my channel. Maybe I'll do a series on them. Please let me know down below if that's something you're interested in seeing because I'll talk a little bit about shelf rotation but once again like I said that's a whole nother video that I can go into on storage and shelf rotation and kind of how I pick and choose what my children are playing with and how I set things up and also how I store them for easy rotation. But anyway let's get into today's video. Right, so I'll just give you a quick overview of the playroom. So this is a setup right now. We have some cubbies here, some shelves and we have a little bookshelf over here. We also have this pull-out sofa couch in here. It kind of serves a perfect purpose of having an extra space for somebody to stay and sleep if they need to, but it also is really great because I can kind of just sit up here and read a book or observe what the children are doing and playing with without being too, you know, over in their faces, which is kind of Montessori inspired. It's to kind of stand back and watch the children and see what they're doing. So I love that we have a little couch in here, although it would offer a bit more space if we took it out, but I'm happy with it in here for the time being. And then over here we have a pickler triangle or a climbing triangle. I have this in a vlog. My husband made this. It's really great for children of all ages. As soon as your child is like starting to show signs of pulling themselves up, you can introduce something like this. It'll give them that gross motor movement to like pull themselves up on the rails right here. And once they start to get that urge to climb, this will be a lifesaver. As I said, my children are three and two and they play with this all the time. The thing that I love about it is it definitely helps develop that gross motor skill, which is an urge that children have. So a lot of the times, you know, you'll notice that your child might be climbing on your furniture or trying to climb up on the TV cabinet, giving them something that they can use to release that urge of the need to climb in a safe way is just going to make your life as a parent so much easier. 
but also allow them to get out that urge without feeling like they're being a bad child or you feeling like they have bad behavior. Because a lot of the times, this age group, it's not so much about bad behavior as it is more so about the child just having a developmental need to fulfill something that they are trying to explore and learn. So a climbing triangle is, I can't give you like enough good things about this. And as they get older, it's great to do with um, balancing and all kinds of stuff. We have a slide here that they can slide down on. And then if you turn it over, it has like the little ladder so they can climb up it. This also serves, it's an open-ended toy, I honestly believe, because my children use this for so many things other than just climbing up and down and sliding on. They will use it as a zoo and they will put their little, or their little zoo uh, figurines that they have and kind of build a little zoo inside of it. They will also, um, it's been a farm as well, they will drape sheets and blankets and all kinds of stuff over it and turn it into like a little cubby house or a little reading area. Uh, they also really like to get their, um, one of their stepping stools, just put that down a few and then they will kind of balance that on their stepping stool. And so then they will also fulfill the urge of maybe needing to jump. So we'll put it down, maybe down onto the third, fourth kind of a rod here and then have it coming across over onto their stepping stool. They'll grab a bunch of pillows and they'll put that all out and they'll jump off it and they'll also pretend it's like a boat and all kinds of stuff. So that's, I really highly recommend that if you're sitting on the fence about getting one or making one yourself. We also have over here the balance board. So once again, this is another thing that you'll commonly see in Montessori playrooms. It's really great for the purpose of a balance board, getting that gross motor movement and that balance. But once again, it's open-ended. My kids use this to be so many things from a whale, a boat, all kinds of stuff. They will both sit on it and sing, row, row, row your boat. They'll turn it over and it's been a storefront recently for my son. He's been really into imaginative play and he'll use that. He'll sit behind it and like gather a few objects from the shelf and then he'll have us come up to it and it's kind of like his storefront. So once again, it's another great open-ended toy, but also allows them to involve movement and get those urges out. Okay, now moving over to our shelving. So we have the cubbies here and then we have some open shelves over there. The cubbies we just bought in Target, really inexpensive and easy to pick up pretty much anywhere. Ikea has some great ones too. And then this little corner shelving unit my husband built because I really wanted a corner shelf and they were hard to find. So anyway, I'll go kind of go through what we have on the shelves right now. So I'll start down here. This is for both the kids to play with, both three and two year olds. It's um, a great, I got these in a set of six, I think, but I only have three out at the moment. And you'll see that's pretty common in a monastery environment is to just don't overwhelm the child with too many options. Just kind of put out enough for them to master. So this caters to both my son and my daughter. My son's pretty much mastered the zipper. He's got that down packed as well as the snaps. My daughter's still working on mastering this one. She's figured out how to snap and close these and my son is still, uh, both of them are still working on the buttons. This is great for fine motor skills to really involve their little fingers and have to really develop that fine motor movement. But it is also great for practical life in terms of encouraging them and helping them figure out how to dress themselves. So those are really cool. I picked those up off Amazon and there's three more to go with it. I think there's like um, a lacing one, a tying a bow one, and then there's another one as well. And then up on the next shelf we have, and you'll see how everything is displayed. Um, in a monastery environment, typically the, all the activities are set up in trays Everything is with what it needs to be. So everything that the child needs to do to complete this activity is right there. It's set up in a way that's kind of pleasing to them and aesthetically pleasing. It gives a good sense of order and helps encourage children to place things back where they got them and keep things together. It helps encourage respect of their items and the respect of who's going to be using that activity next. Um, so you also see that a lot of things are displayed, not done. So if an activity is already done and set up and completed, it's not as inviting and compelling for a child to pull it out and do it. So having activities 
that are not put together and kind of displayed in this manner and you'll see through the shelves. Um, it encourages the child to come over and be like, hey, you know, I want to give that a go. I want to do that. I want to complete it. So that is why things are set up like this. This is, an, um, this is a Melissa and Doug puzzle. Now the puzzle itself is easy for both my children to do at this point where they just kind of put the numbers in. But why I really love this puzzle is because it's really great for number recognition. So under each number, it'll have two turtles. So this is great for just like my son revising really his number recognition with the quantity, the actual amount. And then my daughter is just currently learning that kind of process of the value of one is one object. The value of two is two. So that's a great, just something fun. My daughter loves doing puzzles like this. So it kind of caters to that want and that need to do puzzles like that, but also, but also following in early math. So up here is another one, which is great for a number of different reasons. This can, this is great for fine motor development, their pincher skills, as well as um, color recognition and sorting. Both my children have mastered this and I need to find a way to make it a little bit more complicated for my daughter, but she still loves to do it. She really enjoys this game, this activity. So I have left it out here on the shelf for her. So what she'll do is you'll see that each little B is a different color and then each B can go into the correct colored holes. So she'll either place those in, that's how she started doing it, but now she'll use the little tongs that I've provided and she'll pick those up and she'll put it in the correct color. It's really great for, like I said, that fine motor development and those pincher skills, which are great for later on for learning to write. We have a little rainbow out here. This isn't the traditional kind of rainbow I think that you'll see in a lot of people's um, playrooms. I haven't purchased that one. I found this one. Um, it's a wooden one that's just been painted and I just thought it was really pretty. I put it out here to see what my kids thought of it. And I'll tell you what, the other one's probably definitely worth purchasing because they, once again, this is open-ended. They create bridges and they balance these and they build with these and they use these in their open-ended play and they create all kinds of stuff with this little rainbow set. So that's a really great open-ended activity. And then another thing we have down here is another number puzzle. Like I said, both my children are really into numbers and counting and learning the recognition of what the value of each number is. This is a little Melissa and Doug puzzle because I do have two children that are fairly close together in age, but they're still not at the exact same point. It is a little bit difficult to figure out the playroom setup because this only, I only have in here numbers one through five, whereas my son could definitely go one through 10 without a problem, but then it becomes too challenging for my daughter. So I kind of try to cater to both of those needs to with throughout different activities. But pretty much this is self-correcting, which is another really great thing. It means that you get to sit back, not overstep, not correct the child. You kind of get to just sit back and observe them and they will figure out along the way, even if it's not all the way until the end, that, hey, that kind of fits. But as they go through the puzzle, they'll be like, oh, and they can self-correct and put it with the right number. And once again, it's displayed, not put together. And then moving down here, we have just a basket of vehicles. So, oh, so pretty much in here, they just have a random, um, random different vehicles. They both love vehicles. Um, so they've got a school bus. They've got some little just standard Hot Wheel cars. They've got a little fire truck in there. They've got a monster truck. They do have uh, some random stuff in there. And once again, that's just open-ended play. They'll use their magnet tiles or their blocks to build. And, <laughs> and they'll um, and they'll use those to kind of go along with their open-ended play. That's something that I don't rotate out too often because they do come to those quite frequently, but um, I might just rotate what's in that basket. And then over here is another really great Montessori inspired activity. This is threading or beading, which once again is really great for that fine motor development, um, coordination as well as concentration. So pretty much they take the block and they thread it on. Pretty easy, self-explanatory. However, this um, is now not challenging enough for either of my children. 
it's still on the shelf simply for the purpose that they actually use these as loose bits and pieces and they will build with these. Um, the other day they were using this as like food for their farm animals and they were building a fence with it for their farm. So I do leave it out just purely because I see them using it for other purposes. So I introduced, because that became not challenging enough, I did introduce a smaller beading set to them. Um, and it has some thread down there, rope down there, and then they can still bead with much smaller pieces. It's way more challenging and exciting for them now than trying to actually thread and bead this set. But they still use that, like I said, for other purposes. So I have that one just placed up here on the top shelf. And then moving along, we just have some large Lego pieces. Um, I really like, there's a couple different sets in here. Once again, this is an open-ended activity, which is really great. They can build and do whatever they want with this. An excavator, which they love to use, and a dump truck. And then they also have um, things in here to build an aeroplane with. And then all the other bits and pieces. So just another open-ended activity. And also my open-ended activities stay out here on the shelves because they just can find so many different ways to play with them. Another thing that they love, they both love to play with and one thing that doesn't really leave the shelf, although I will change out what's in here from time to time, is tools. They really love to pretend to fix things and build things. So they have a bunch of different tools in here. Now typically in a monastery playroom, you wouldn't see a lot of plastic, um, definitely more natural materials, but we've got some wooden stuff in here, but otherwise, there is plastic as well. Like I said, you can start Monastery and it doesn't have to be crazy expensive and you can kind of work with probably what you already have at home and then slowly introduce other materials or more natural stuff. But this is just what works for us and I'm happy for them to use these even though they're plastic. And then we have another tray down here. This is the music tray so I always have some form of musical instruments out for them and once again I will just rotate what I have out so we have some maracas here a little tambourine we have some cylinders a xylophone um, so they can play with that and kind of get that movement and they have a lot of fun with those and then we have a puzzle over here once again going back to how things aren't displayed put together so it's more inviting for the child to come over and want to complete it. So this is just a Melissa and Doug puzzle. It's a construction puzzle because they're both really into construction vehicles right now. So I'm catering to that sense of, oh, let's learn about construction vehicles um, by supplying them with a the puzzle, the interest that they have. So that's another puzzle. That puzzle is probably a little bit challenging for my daughter, but my son's able to manage that one. And then over here, you'll see a more traditional Montessori activity or material. Um, this is probably what you'll see in a Montessori classroom, this type of puzzles, and both my kids love these. So once again, the puzzle pieces are in here and they have to figure out how to put this together, which can be a little bit challenging because as you can see, if you don't have it in the exact right spot, it's not going to fit. We also have over here another Montessori material. This is the cylinders. My son can complete this now without a problem. My daughter is still, she can complete, if I only have two out, she does it without a problem, but when it gets to four, she kind of starts to be like, ooh, but she's managing it. So this is another great one. I think it lasts through a lot of ages. Pretty much what they have to do here is they have to figure out which cylinder goes into which hole and line them all up. There's different depths and widths and lengths and, they have to kind of figure out how that works and it gives them some concepts. Up here we have another activity which is mainly focused to my daughter. It's not challenging for her in a sense. You can easily pick things up and place them in. But they do enjoy the farm animals and like I said, they'll actually take these little wooden farm animals and they will use those with their magnetiles or their building blocks and they'll use those for other purposes as well. I just realized I didn't show you guys this last basket. Now I wanted to show you guys this because this is not typical Montessori at all. Um, typically you would see this um, like figurines, you would see probably more so people or farm animals, real life things. However, we do have some stuff in here that is not real life like dragons and a little puppy from um, Paw Patrol. 
but they do enjoy playing with these and I'm okay with it. So I don't mind that it's not based in reality. And we just open that up for discussion. So we'll talk about, hey, are dragons real? Do they really do this? Or hey, do puppy doggies really talk? No, they don't. So we open up and I try to set the tone that it's not based in reality. And then, sorry, back to the last two items on our shelf. We have a, um, this used to be in a little basket. I don't know what happened to it. But anyway, we have another counting activity. This is mainly aimed at Zayden, my three-year-old, as Avira is still learning the concept of the quantity of each number and the number recognition, whereas Zayden has it down packed. I do have it only set to five and he can probably easily do to 10. But once again, I still want it to be inviting for my daughter. So when Zayden's doing it, if I'm noticing that he wants to continue on, I will just grab six through 10 and more counters for him. And pretty much you can make this self-correcting by only supplying the correct amount of counters for what you have out. So what he'll do is he'll lay out one, he'll find this is two, this is three, and so forth all the way through. And then he'll place the counters underneath. One, two, one, two, three, and so forth. So he's recognizing the number and understanding the quantity. And then soon we'll be moving on to um, things that are a little bit more challenging for him. And then we have the, this is once again mainly aimed towards Zayden as he's been really interested in learning his alphabet and the phonetic sound. So these are traditional monastery material, the sandpapered letters. So I won't go into it right now, but if you want more information on learning their sounds, I can do another video on that, but pretty much you'd go through a lesson with them on these on the alphabet, you only introduce three to four at a time and you kind of, um, they're sandpapered so they're textured so it's engaging multiple senses instead of just like telling them what something is. They can, they will learn to trace the number for later on for writing. So he's gone through all of that process. He has a pretty good understanding of how to trace them. He, uh, he knows um, what sound each one makes and he can tell you. So to make it a little bit more exciting and challenging for him now, in these drawers are different, oh, nothing in that one, he's been in here playing with this. Oh, where have they put them all? So in these drawers there's, oh they've all gone into one drawer. Um, typically they're spread out amongst the four drawers but my son's obviously played with this. In these drawers are different objects that start with the sound of these letters. Tiger, t tiger, and he'll place it under the t and so forth mushroom, mushroom, mm, mushroom. So it starts to give them recognition of the starting sounds that words make and then later on we will start um, blending the words together. So we might do something where we have m, a, t, mat and so forth. And then moving on, this is another thing that stays in rotation all of the time and that is our magnetile set. Once again, great open-ended activity. If you don't have these, I 100% highly suggest getting these. All children love them of all ages, and they're a great open-ended activity. And moving along onto our bookshelf. So I think it's really important to have an open-faced bookshelf to start with. It's more inviting for the children to come up and be able to truly see what the books are. Um, this bookshelf is getting a little bit too small for, for us now, so my husband is actually building a much bigger one. But pretty much we rotate books around um, depending on the kids' interests. And like I said, in a typical Montessori environment, you would only see books that are based in reality um, rather than stuff that is clearly not true. For example, a tractor that has eyes and talks and saves people. However, my son loves Tractor Mac and I don't mind incorporating things that aren't based in reality. Like I said earlier, we just have a discussion about it. Do tractors really have eyes and talk? No, they don't. And then we still have a lot of things here. I spy books are great, but my kids are really into um, finding things and playing I spy. This is another really great book that I love, that they both love. Brown Bear has been a favorite since a long time, so has Dear Zoo. Um, and then these are really great Montessori books. These are the two I have out at the moment, once again, working with numbers and shapes. And they also kind of have the, like the sandpaper letters, so you can trace the number, teach them to trace the number, and then we can, this is one, and then 
we count the pigs, this is two. Count the cars, this is three, and so forth. And it's textured, so they're getting those sensors again. So that's our bookshelf. We do rotate books around. So before COVID happened, we used to go to the library as well, but right now due to COVID, we're not really going to the library, so we're just rotating books around that we already have. And then that's about it. Oh, lastly, we still, we have one more little basket over here, which once again, is a basket that pretty much constantly stays in rotation. It's just a basket full of balls and we do have some bean bags here. If you don't have bean bags, I suggest getting these for your kids of all ages. Bean bags are great. Um, this is another great thing to help with the urge of feeling like they want to throw because it's developmentally normal for children to want to see that reaction of, hey, this was in my hand and now it's not. Or, hey, if I take this bean bag and I throw it over here, it comes down onto the other side. And I allow them to do that as long as they are using things that I have provided that I feel are safe in. All right, and that's the end of the playroom tour. I hope that you guys enjoyed coming along and seeing our Monastery-inspired playroom. And like I said, if you want to see more videos based on Monastery, because I seriously have such a strong passion for it, I should have said in the beginning, I am not qualified in Monastery. I am not a teacher. I don't have any form of qualifications. I have purely just learned through passion, reading books, um, doing my own research and incorporating it in my own home with my own children. We've been doing Monastery at home with our kids since my son was little. Um, I kind of stumbled across it realizing that I already was implementing some of the Monastery philosophies and then I just decided to really dive deeper into it and now we pretty much use it in our home and my son does go to, well, he's supposed to be going to a Monastery preschool but due to COVID. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. But anyway, we'll be homeschooling him for the first semester, Montessori homeschool. So let me know if you're interested in seeing things based upon maybe like a preschool, homeschool, Montessori environment as well, and what kind of activities, what kind of curriculum we'll be following. But I really hope that you enjoyed this Montessori playroom and I would love to do more Montessori videos. Just let me know down below what you want to see because I definitely want to make sure I'm giving you guys what you want and what you maybe need a little bit more information on or help with implementing in your home. But as always, guys, have a great day, make it count, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.